Thank you. Um, can, oh, okay, Mike is on. Uh, and uh, good morning. Uh, let's see if this works. Hi, my name is Yen, and I'm currently working as the server architect at the social media, social networking startup called Yabo, that's based in Holborn. And despite my title, I actually work, you know, I just write code every single day, uh, both at my, at my day job as well as in the evening, in my spare time. And as I look at my career progression the last couple of years, I've gone from doing gaming to working in e-commerce to now in social networking. But one thing has stayed the same for me uh, in that I've always worked for companies whose logo is red. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, and then my wife comes to me and say, well, actually, yes, she, well, actually me, uh, th that none of these logos are red because uh, red is a very specific color that uh, <laughs> I just have a difficulty um, you know, make differentiating from all these other shades of red. And turns out, well, early research say that maybe it's genetics that women tend to have better color perception than men. But more recent re uh, researchers have shown that, in fact, by looking at how color perception develops in children, they found that linguistics and color perception are actually very closely linked together. And for, as part of that study, the BBC went to visit an Amazonian tribe called Himba, who is very interesting in that they only have four words to describe color. And in most uh, Western Hemisphere uh, well, um, countries, you have 11 words. And for the Himba people, they have four words. And of them, of them, three words describe different shades of blue and green. And when they conducted a study with the Himba people, they found that uh, for the Himba people, they, have a, they can very quickly spot the green square that's slightly different. I don't know if the projection here uh, helps you guys, but usually for me, I have a hard time finding the one in the, so I guess, one o'clock uh, 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 direction. Uh, that is a slightly different shade of green. But because they use the same words to describe both blue and green, the Himba has a hard time picking out the blue square from this green. Which then raises an interesting question that perhaps without the means to express an idea in our language, we are, we are not able to have that idea at all. Because the language that we use, it helps define the model that we use to view the world, which in turn shapes the thoughts that we have. And keep that in mind as we go through a whirlwind tour of about five languages in 25 minutes, uh, where we're going to look at a number of languages I've spent time with the last couple of years, and some of the interesting ideas I've found in those languages that have helped change the way I see programming. And I hope by the end of the, uh, of the tour, they will do the same for you as well and help you question what is possible. We we'll start that with F Sharp, which is my personal favorite language. And uh, one of the nice features that came out of F Sharp 4 is this idea of type providers. The application that you tend to be building nowadays, they're no longer standalone. They have to interact with the outside world. You have to consume data in CSV, JSON, XML formats. You have to talk to some cloud-hosted services somewhere or connect to your database. But your workflow is still more or less the same. You tend to define your DTO types, and then you do some I.O., and the data you get back, you then marshal them into your DTO type, and then you start doing the actually useful thing that you want to do with them in the first place. The first three steps of this typical workflow is kind of repetitive, and all you're doing is you're helping the compiler get typed information from some external data source. And it's a process that's been right for automation for quite some time, and the type providers give you a mechanism for providing type information to the compiler without you doing all the manual work. And it uh, integrates with IntelliSense and Tooltips and works in both Mono and .NET. Uh, as well as in a host of number of different IDEs, such as Visual Studio, Xamarin, Modern Develop, uh, Code, uh, Atom, and so on. And because I've worked with uh, Amazon Web Services very closely for a number of years now, so one of the type providers I wrote is to help me get type access to S3. So you might be able to see very clearly, but at the top of the screen, I've got a type that represents my S3 account. Then I've got a type that represents a bucket I have in my account. And from then on, every time I press dot, while still, stay, still inside my F-sharp repo, the IDE is making a call to S3, and based on the data that comes back, generate types on the fly so that I can have IntelliSense over the buckets and objects I have in my S3 account. And I can also do the same thing uh, with a search. Here I'm creating a type that represents a search in S3 by prefix. And when I press dot, 
the search is uh, that is making a call to the uh, to S3 uh, to do the search, and the search results that comes back are then used to generate types on the fly, so that I can very quickly get access to the data I'm looking for. So. It's very helpful for me because uh, I had to work with S3 all the time and my workflow used to be that I have to uh, go to open a different tool, download the data, and then, and then write some code to read the data, do some manip uh, manipulation, and then save data back. Now I can do all of that inside my Visual Studio or code uh, nowadays. And helps me remove all these magic strings I have in my code and I get compiled time validation as, as well. So if my code depends on some object in S3 to exist, I don't have to wait until runtime to find out that someone has accidentally deleted that, uh, deleted that object. The next time I compile my code, if the S3 object is missing, then my code won't compile. And I also don't have to manage any code generation myself. And all the types that are generated on the fly, they are erased to the object type at runtime anyway. So you can easily scale to having millions and millions of types without blowing up the CLR. So the S3 type of value is something that I wrote myself, uh, for myself, but there's a whole, host of number of, a whole range of different type of values available for you already. Many, most of all of them are produced, pretty much all of them are produced by the community, for the community. Um, you've got type providers for reading data from JSON, and XML, so no longer do you have to create a, uh, look at a JSON file uh, and then uh, work out what properties are there, create a type that represents the data structure you want to get back from the file, read the file, and then marshal it into your type. You just let the type provider do that for you. There's also type providers for um, hitting a Wusto service or the World Bank database. And there's even type providers for you to get access to functions that's written in R, in MATLAB, or Python, so that if you're doing a lot of data science stuff, then you, can, you don't have to use R for everything. Some things are, R is good for. It's got loads of uh, uh, functions, loads of statistic uh, uh, um, functions they can use. You can do everything else in F sharp, but still use the functions that you already have and familiar with from R inside your F-sharp script. There's also other uh, fun ones, uh, uh, for example, like the DonSime type provider. DonSime is the creator of the F-sharp language, so uh, in tribute to him, one of the communities uh, decided to create a DonSime type provider over here. Every time you press a dot, you get a, f a fact about DonSime. In his... Um, Really good blog. Uh, Daniel Higginbottom talked about how a clean design is one that supports visual thinking so that people can meet the information needs with a minimum of conscious effort. Now consider how we read English. We read it from left to right and top to bottom, and that's how we read code most of the time as well. Except when it comes to reading nested method calls or function calls, in which case the flow is now reversed. We are now reading from right to left and bottom up. So all of a sudden, we've got this disparity in how we visually process code. And remember, people reading our code shouldn't have to work very hard to understand what it is that we're trying to tell them, which is why it's great that in F sharp, we've got the pipes idiom. And the pipes operator allows you to write nested function calls as a pipeline that flows from left to right and top to bottom. And I'll show you how this works. The top line here is, now, is, is first evaluated. You're going to get back a circle object, who is then passed on to the next line as a second argument to a field function that has now been uh, partially applied with a color. That completes the invocation to field function, and then whose result is then passed on to the next line, and so on. It works the same way as um, Unix pi uh, pipes, uh, and has been, it's a very popular idiom that everybody uses uh, inside the F-sharp community and has been copied over to Elixir and Elm now as well, and has been really embraced by those communities too. And in the late 90s, um, there was a famous or rather infamous incident where NASA sent off a Mars orbiter, and on its way to Mars, it actually crash landed into the moon because one of the engineers wrote a function that takes in a distance, uh, the flow that's supposed to be measured in kilometers or miles, but uh, one of his colleagues, Call the function with a flow that's measured in kilometers instead. And that simple mistake, the one that all of us would make, and one of us probably have made at some point in our, in our careers, cost NASA $125 million. That was back in the 90s, so it would be worth a lot more money nowadays. And it just goes to show that it doesn't matter how smart you are, you are still going to make mistakes from time to time because human errors is still an unavoidable fact of life, which is why. It's great that we have language features to help prevent this type of error, a whole class of human errors 
like the one that NASA has suffered from. And the way it works is that you can declare a type that represents some numeric uh, unit, and then you can decorate it with the measure attribute at the top there. And from then on, you can use it to add contextual information to numeric values that you have in your code. And out of the box, it handles combination of units correctly. So 10 meters divided by two seconds is going to end up with five meters per second, not just five, but with a specific unit. So that if you've got a function that expects that, has, that takes in a flow, and you expect that flow to be measured in kilometers, then you, you can declare in your function that this flow is not just any flow, it's a flow of particular unit. So that if someone tries to call your code with the wrong, with a naked flow or a flow with a different type of a different unit, then they'll find out compile time that they're doing something wrong rather than having to wait until runtime like uh, NASA did and uh, suffer uh, quite a big loss. And with that, uh, I'd like to move us, to, move us on to uh, JVM-based language uh, closure. In this, they got, we have this concept of homo-iconicity, which is a, a, a mouthful, at least for me. And when I look it up on Wikipedia, I get a sort of definition that I usually get on Wikipedia for computer science terms, which is very long, tedious read, and doesn't really make much sense by the time I finish reading it. But uh, to me, homo-iconicity means that uh, your code and your data structure are represented in a very similar way in your language. And if you haven't seen any Lisp code before, this is how you do a lab binding uh, in Clojure, where we bind x to the value 1, and then we call increment on x, which is, of course, going to give us the value 2 as return value. And the two most common data types you're going to work with uh, in, the, uh, in Clojure is a list or a vector. And notice the syntactic structure of a list is identical to the function call we just saw. So we can actually interpret the function call as a list itself of three elements, a symbol, a vector and another list. And we can, since we can represent code and data similarly, we can also go back and forth between the two representations using the quote and eval function. So if I've got a function that, uh, well, a function call that adds one and two together, I can call quote on that to get back the code as data. And I can also use the quote notation shorthand, uh, shorthand notation. And once I've done that, I can call eval on that data to evaluate it as code. Now, you may ask yourself, well, what's, then to stop, what's there to stop you then to capture code as data, manipulate the data to generate new code, which is exactly what uh, macros give you. If you want to write your own assertion library, uh, this is how you may want to write an assert equals. Uh, I've got a blog post that goes into detail how this thing actually works. But the nice thing about this macro is that when the assertion fails, you get the expression as well as the value which is a lot more than what you normally get with uh, n unit or j unit, where you just get the expected and the actual value. You can see they're different, but you, you now have to go and hunt down how do you got, how they get those values in the first place and work out, you know, okay, which bit of code I need to change. And when I call the sir equals the macro, the expressions that are, that are passed in are then captured as data and bound to the actual and expected variables I've defined in my macro definition which I then use to return the new block of code I want to run instead. And that block of code is quoted, so it's returned as data. And that transformation process happens at compile time. And if you are actually writing a macro yourself, then you can also use the macro expand function to help you check how your, your macro invocation is expanded into in full. And next, I'd like to move on to a relatively new language, uh, Rust. Um, it's been in the works for quite a number of years, and at various points I've played with it in the past, it's just every new version is breaking changes, you have to rewrite everything. Uh, it's kind of painful, but as of last year, I think this time last year, um, they reached the 1.0 milestone, uh, so if you want to check out Rust, now is a pretty, uh, pretty good time. Having worked with um, managed language, uh, languages in the past, uh, you probably appreciate the, G, the garbage collector as much as I do. It does a lot of work for us. It helps us, well, removes us from having to manage memory ourselves, and also it gives us this illusion of having an infinite amount of memory space to allocate into, which is great. It's very convenient, but it also comes with a runtime cost, especially because you've got this, uh, you've given developers a full sense of uh, safety of having this infinite amount of memory space you can allocate to, so that that is now open to abuse as well. 
And it's not unheard of to have applications that are so aggressive in allocation that at runtime they spend more time, CPU time doing garbage collection than is actually doing useful work. So the nice, the big idea that came out of Rust is this idea of an ownership system that aim to give you memory safety without needing a garbage collector, at least without a general purpose garbage collector like we do in .NET and Java. And it does so by doing deterministic deallocation. So as and when variables go out of scope, they are deallocated automatically. And uh, uh, combine that with compile time analysis to make sure that data races cannot exist in your code at all at compile time so that we don't have to incur the runtime to ensure that. The idea is to give you what is commonly referred to as zero cost abstraction, uh, meaning you want to get the safety of high level language features, but at the same time retain the speed and performance of a low level language. And this is how you write a simple full function in the Rust, uh, where, where we're doing two bindings, we're creating a three element vector assigned to V, and then we create an empty vector assigned to V2. The interesting thing is that when full goes out of scope, both V2 within V2, Specifically, the, vector, the memory resources that have been allocated for the vectors would be collected deterministically. And that you may notice that there's also a mute keyword uh, in front of V2. That's because uh, variables, are, well, bindings are mutable by default. And when we create a vector and bind to, to, a, ver uh, to a value, the, the binding V takes ownership of the underlying resource, the memory uh, that's been allocated for the vector. But when we so then assign V to V2, we have moved that ownership to a new binding, which means it's no longer safe for us then to use V going forward. And if we try to do that, we're gonna get a compile time error. And the same works when you have another function that takes a vector. So if I call take with V, we have moved ownership of the vector to the corresponding argument in take. So when take finishes, it goes out of scope, it will try to deallocate the resource. So which means by the time we finish, we uh, come out of take, we try to use V again, it's not a safe operation, and we will get told by the compiler. And the analogy that I like to use is that uh, suppose you've got a book that I want to read, I can offer to buy that book from you. And if you're very nice to me, then you will say, sure, uh, go ahead, uh, now here you go. But because the book is now mine, I can do with it as I see fit, which includes uh, just uh, burning it to the ground. Uh, so you, now if you come back to me and say, hey, but I still want to read that book, well, guess what, uh, tough. <laughs> Which of course is a bit mean, which is why in the language we also have a concept of uh, borrowing so that you don't have to transfer ownership outright every single time. And to do that, you pass a reference instead. So notice the end operator in front of the vector. Uh, that's just how you do, uh, how you notate that, um, uh, notate that uh, say that this is a reference to a, a vector rather than a vector itself. So now when we call take, we can pass a reference instead of the binding itself. So when take finishes, now the ownership for the underlying resource is now back to us, so we can safely continue to use V going forward. And our conversation becomes a bit more civilized, whereby I offer to, buy, to borrow your book instead, and you say, sure, I'm still very nice to you, this why you burned my last, last book, so here you go. Um, and since you're so nice to me, so I have to return a favor, and I have to return the book back to you in the same condition that, that you lent it, me to, lent it to me in, which is to say that the references are also immutable by default. So if in my take function, I try to mutate the vector that's been passed in, then I'll get a compile time error. And to do that, I have to be explicit about where I, want, where I need mutability, so I have to take a mutable reference instead, which in turn requires you to call the function with a mutable reference, uh, which in turn requires you to create a mutable binding in the first place. And when it comes to borrowing, there are two rules of borrowing. Rule number one, is that the borrower scope should not outlast the owners because when the owner scope finishes, he is responsible for cleaning up the resources. And rule number two is that um, you can either have many readers or exactly one writer. And considering that for data rates to exist in your code, three conditions have to be met simultaneously. That you have two or more pointers to the same resource, 
one of them, at least one of them is writing, and that you are performing unsynchronized operations. Since the idea is to, get, is to do away with runtime uh, synchronization altogether, so C is always going to hold for us, and now our job is to make sure that A and B do not hold at the same time. And when you have only readers, then the condition B is not going to hold, and when you have exactly one writer, then condition A cannot hold either, which is how you can eliminate data races at compile time without needing a garbage collector to help you at runtime. And with uh, Rust, we've seen that there's a uh, there's a lot you can do at compile time, but there's still a whole host of uh, execution or errors and uh, bugs in your execution logic that is not helping you to catch. But we also saw with you need a measure that the more information you can provide to the compiler and enrich your, con your conversation with the compiler, the more you help the compiler catch bugs for you that you wouldn't be able to catch otherwise. And types can be a very powerful tool for you to communicate your intent as well as the constraint of your application in terms of what it should do as well as what it shouldn't do uh, to the compiler. And if you work with um, C Sharp or Java or Hacks or, or Dart or a number of other languages, you have seen generics, which actually came from a concept from functional programming called parametric polymorphism. It's in that you can have a type that depends on some type uh, parameter so that a list of integers is actually different from a list of strings or a list of cats. And if you try to add a string to a list of integers, you get a compile time error. Now, what if? What if we can take the idea and make it and take it a step forward, and you can have types that can depend on arbitrary values? Then perhaps a vector of n elements of type A can be encoded and encapsulated, so and captured in its entirety in the type system. So one of the things that we commonly uh, we don't normally have is uh, you have uh, you have you have you have you have array or a list. And the, the length is something that's only determined at runtime. That's not, that's not something that we, and if you have a function that requires a, a, a array of a certain length, that's not a constraint of your application that you can communicate to the compiler with types. But with dependent types in the Idris, you can do that. So that where I have a function such as zip with that requires two vectors as input, two vectors of the same, length and um, return and the function returns a vector of the same length, that constraint that's usually implemented and implied by in our code is now surfaced and uh, communicated to the compiler so the compiler can ensure that you, uh, can ensure that, that will always be the case so that I don't have to do checks in my implementation code. And if you hang around with uh, functional programmers uh, a lot, then you probably hear this, sort of, this phrase quite often, that we want to do type-driven development, TDD, which is unfortunate because there's already a TDD that stands for something else already. Uh, but the idea here is that you try to use types as a way to, 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 to prove the application is going to do what you want it to do and only what you want it to do and nothing else so that you can eliminate illegal states from your domain, from your model altogether so that you don't have to spend time later on to deal with them. Of course, making an ego state un unrepresentable in our, uh, is, uh, is the goal. I don't think any of the language has quite get us there yet, uh, but with uh, dependent types in the Idris, it's probably the closest one we've got. And then, uh, I don't know how many Haskell developers we have in the audience, but in Haskell, you've got this idea of Monad, and IO Monad is, one of, uh, is where you, it's, where, it's the only place where you can do IO, but there's no, there's no, there's no control on what type of I.O. you can do, whereas uh, in, the, um, in Idris, you also have an interesting effect system which allows you to have very fine granular control over what type of I.O. can be performed, be it to, least, uh, to read from, the, from, uh, from standard in, or write to standard out, or write to, um, to network, et cetera, et cetera. And with that, and that concludes our whirlwind tour of uh, five programming languages. But how do you go about learning a new language yourself, uh, especially when people on the internet keep saying things like it takes 10,000 hours to be good at something, which is pretty daunting. Uh, if I spend nine hours a day, that means that it's going to take me four years just to be, just to be good at something, um, which is pretty crazy and it's also wrong. <laughs> because the original research actually said that it takes 10,000 hours of practice to get to the top of an ultra-competitive field. 
and since we are still over, uh, we still we are we having Euro 2016 right now. So uh, that's if you want to get to the top of the football world, such as Lionel Messi or Cristiano Ronaldo or Wayne Rooney, and England fans here. <laughs> well, and the, he's the best we've got in the country. Um, at least I believe so. But the, the bad news is that just because you're working nine to five, it doesn't mean that you're clocking eight hours towards your 10,000 hour milestone. Because learning has to be deliberate and it has to be challenging. Imagine if you play football for 90 minutes and how physically exhausted and tired you are, at least I, will, I am, uh, learn, sp spending 90 minutes learning something new should feel like that, but maybe less physically, but more mentally. And most of the time when you're working, you are applying knowledge that you already have to solve problems that's in front of you. And certainly, employers don't, don't pay us all this money so that we can be learning on a job constantly. But the good news is that, at least according to George Kaufman, his excellent TED talk, it only takes 20 hours to be relatively good at something. Uh, it's not going to take you to the top of the world, but at least you're going to be relatively competent yourself. And after that, your rate of improvement is going to start to slow down, eventually flatten out. And we've all experienced that after spending years with uh, C Sharp or Java. It takes us uh, much longer to get to the next level uh, compared to when we first started. And he also offered the four useful uh, tips on how to help you learn. First, you want to set your goal. You want to know why you want to learn X. And uh, keep in mind that most of things that we consider as skills, they're actually bundles of skills. So for example, coding or programming is not just one skill. It's an incredibly large umbrella of so many different skill sets with uh, so many um, specialized areas inside that. You've got the uh, UI, you've got UX, you've got different languages and paradigms, and you have uh, specialized areas such as uh, uh, distributed systems, databases, system engineering, and so on and so forth. There's so many specialized areas. Each one of them go very, very deep itself that it's not possible for any of us to master all of them in our lifetime. So the more you're able to break up the skill set that you're after, the more it's going to help you decide and prioritize what's going to help you and uh, pro sorry, prioritize your learning so that it helps you improve your performance in the shortest amount of time possible. And once you start, you want to aim to get to the point where you can self-edit and self-correct as you go. And the good news is that most of the books and courses are already structured to help you get there faster um, first. And once you get there, then you can use other resources such as blogs or Stack Overflow to learn at bite sizes. And the next one is crucial, that when you're learning, try to remove all your distractions. So social media, TV, all of that, try to, try to, try to remove them whilst you're trying to learn, or even your family and, and, and your pets as well. Uh, I mean, personally, I'm a, I'm a big TV fan or junkie. I watch a lot of TV during the week. Uh, Game of Thrones is on right now. So, uh, and then there's also all these uh, superhero-based uh, comic books uh, stuff. Uh, you've got Mar Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. You've got Arrow, Flash, Supergirl, uh, Gotham, and so on and so forth. So I actually spend a lot of hours every week just watching TV. But I try to contain them so that I do them in a binge on, uh, say, Saturday evening or Saturday uh, morning so that I can leave the rest of the week the, in the evening so I can to, to actually do something useful with my time. And with most things that you learn, uh, you end up hitting some kind of frustration barrier at some point. So it's important for you to pre-allocate, pre-commit certain amount of time, say 20 hours for the activity, so that when you do get to that point, maybe after five hours of trying to learn Rust, then having budgeted yourself 20 hours to learn Rust anyway, then you may as well just stick with it for long enough so that you actually get some benefit at the end of it. At that, once you get to that at uh, the end of 20 hours, maybe you can ask yourself, how good do I want to be at uh, X to decide how much more time you want to invest in learning that thing versus uh, something else. I mean, personally, my goal for learning all these languages is not to be competent in them enough so that I can get a job tomorrow as a Go developer or a Clojure developer, but to help expand my mind and see a possibility that I couldn't see before with the, with the languages uh, that, are, that I'm familiar with. Uh, in terms of learning a programming language, um, these two books by Bruce Tate are excellent. They cover quite a number of different languages across a number of different uh, paradigms. And given the choice, I would personally always prioritize learning a new paradigm over a new, uh, learning a new language in a paradigm I'm already familiar with. 
if you're a C-sharp developer moving to C, uh, Java or vice versa, by and large, you're learning a new syntax to express ideas that you already have and solve problems in ways that you already know how to. And the paradigms, even more so than languages, determines how we, shapes how we problem solve and, uh, and, the, and the type of solutions that we are capable of coming up with. And there are so many different interesting paradigms out there for you to learn as well. You can learn about logic programming with Prolog or Mini Cameron, or you can learn about stack-oriented programming with uh, Factor or Fourth. And then there's also my, one of my recent favorites, uh, which is uh, array programming with APL. Yes, I just mentioned APL to an audience of 500 people. Uh, Alan Perley once said that a language that doesn't change the way you think about programming is not worth knowing. But of course, it's the 21st century, we all work for companies, so there's other practical considerations that we have to make when switching language. When you go, from, uh, go to a new language in the same paradigm, you have new frameworks become available to you, and you're going to get different trade-offs and performance uh, characteristics based on the runtime. And hiring is also a big factor to consider as well inside a company. But when you move to a new paradigm, you unlock entirely new approaches to solving problems that you probably didn't have before. And it gets you asking different questions and start looking at problems from different angles. And once you combine, we've heard about uh, quite a lot about diversity already, but diversity doesn't have to exist in the team only. It can exist in every single one of you when you are capable of thinking in different ways and wearing different hats. Then you can start seeing problems from many different angles and start thinking outside of the box. So from a personal point of view, learning a new paradigm is much more beneficial from your, uh, to, for your um, personal development. And with that, we are slightly over time, so I'm just going to leave you with another quote uh, from another great man, that learning is an act of creation itself because something happens in all of you that wasn't there before. Thank you. <laughs>